The Nature Conservancy, live in classrooms around the world to teach how nature works to provide our clean air, water, food, and energy. Learn what you can do to help keep nature healthy and productive. for today's virtual made possible with generous support from Lowe's. Today we're visiting a magical ecosystem in Colombia called the Paramo. It might be unlike anything else you've ever seen. Colombia is located in South America. It shares a border to the Northwest with Panama, to the East with Venezuela and Brazil, and to the South with Ecuador and Peru. Equator, passes through the southern part of Colombia. There are over 300 different types of ecosystems in Colombia, which is not surprising, considering it's home to part of the Amazon jungle, the towering Andes Mountains, and it has two coastlines along the Pacific Ocean and the Caribbean Sea. These different ecosystems contribute to the large variety of organisms that live there. And Colombia is amazing because it makes up only 0.003% of Earth's land area, but has 10% of the planet species. This means there is a huge variety of animals and plants concentrated in one place. You'll find everything from small hummingbirds to large mammals like the jaguar and the spectacled bear you'll see today. Our trip takes place in the stunning landscapes found just beyond the city of Bogota, a magical ecosystem called the Paramo. I've never been to the Paramo, so I'm just as excited as you are to dive further into this incredible place. And before we get started, I want you to meet our guide for our field trip today, Alejandro Calavache from the Nature Conservancy in Bogota, Colombia. Alejandro, it's great to have you with us. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Hi, Tyler. Thank you. It's so great to be here. Um, and hello to everyone watching there. Um, I grew up in the city of Bogota with my three older brothers. And of course, I spent lots of time outside in the park near home, playing football, soccer, and biking with my pals. Um, and I remember very clearly when I was six, and I got these... Um, science game box as a gift from my parents. And I did plenty of basic science experiments Some played with water and other materials. I got attracted by science, that was very fun. And then more recently, I joined the Nature Conservancy in 2007, where I lead the water security program in Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, Panama, and Costa Rica. Thanks, Alejandro. I look forward to hearing a lot more about your work in just a minute. But before we talk more, let's take a moment to explore how this virtual field trip works and talk about how you can ask questions and get involved along the way. In the default view for YouTube, you'll find a chat box in the upper right-hand corner. If you're logged into Google, you can enter questions at the bottom of this box. So if you're not already logged in, you can do so now. And when you have a question, you can type it where it says, say something. If you think of a good question along the way, just type it in the box and we'll try to get to as many of these questions during the episode as we can. All right, ready to have some fun? During our trip today, we're gonna to be playing a game called Nature Spy. We sent your teacher a list of plants and animals that you'll see during today's field trip. Pay close attention. When you see an animal or one of the plants on screen, look for it on your worksheet 
and make a check mark next to what you saw. Now, besides the hundreds of classrooms watching the virtual field trip live, we also have a class of sixth grade students from White Oaks Middle School in Silver Spring, Maryland. They're here to chat with us. Thank you so much for helping us out. Hey class. We're so glad you could join us today. We'll be hearing more from the students at White Oaks Middle School later on, but now let's get started with our field trip to Columbia. As I mentioned earlier, we're gonna be traveling all the way to South America. We'll visit Chingasa National Park, where we'll explore the Paramo ecosystem. And we'll also visit the capital of Colombia, Bogota. Let's take a look and see where we're headed. incredible place. There's such an amazing diversity of landscapes and so many interesting plants and animals. I've spent time in South America, but I've never been to Colombia. Now, Alejandro, this is home for you. Can you tell us a little bit about what it's like to be there? Well, when I was about eight years old, my parents took uh, my brothers and me to Chingasa National Park for the first time. We spent um, the whole day up there. We did a lot of trails and hikes. It was amazing. But lots of things uh, amazed me when I was there, actually. Um, so when you enter in the park, you can feel how quiet it is compared to the noisy city of Bogota. That was, that was very cool. But then you can feel how fresh the air is and clean, so you can deeply breathe. That's amazing. But the thing that actually attracted me the most is that you can see water flowing from everywhere, literally from everywhere. It's not only water in rivers and lagoons, but water draining from the rocks, from shrubs, from the soil. So basically, water everywhere. It's very hard to me to choose one favorite site in Chingasional Park because all of it is just amazing. That sounds awesome. I wish we could all be there in person, but I'm glad that we're at least getting a virtual tour with you. So can you describe the geography of the park and tell us what the weather is like? Uh, if I'm going to come and visit, I need to know what to pack in my suitcase. Of course. Um, geography in the park is really dramatic. Uh, there are a wide variety of landscape with areas as low as 2,000 feet and mountains as high as 13 feet, 13,000 feet. Could you imagine that? 
it can be pretty chilly in the park. Temperatures range um, are from about 40 to let's say 70 degrees Fahrenheit, and it's often misty and cloudy. So you definitely need to wear some layers here. Yeah, and it looks like there's such a diversity of, of natural environments there. I hear that Chingasa is a really popular place for people to travel. Um, and there's some awesome hiking trails. And I look forward to hearing more about the natural features of Chingasa later. But I know that it's also important to the country, uh, to the city of Bogota, because the national park supplies a percent of Bogota's drinking water. That's crazy to think about. Can you tell us a little bit more about how this national park, this, this, this beautiful natural area, provides water for this very large urban area? Yes, you are right. Uh, Bogota is the capital and the largest city in Colombia. Over 8 million people live there. It is just a little smaller than New York City. Um, and we have both uh, rainy and dry seasons throughout the year. Um, during the dry seasons, the area needs water, animals and people survive until the rains come again. That's where the paramo comes in. Um, the moss and all the plants of the paramo act as reservoirs of water, absorbing it during the rainy season and slowly releasing it year round. Plants and soils also act as a water natural filter, you know, uh, and help to clean water. This water provides drinking water to millions of people. Can you imagine that? If you take a second to think about it, nature helps to provide clean drinking water to millions of people. That's really cool how nature works as both a water storage and filtration system. And if I understand it correctly, we still need to use water filtration plants at the very end to make sure that the drinking water is clean, but nature goes a really long way in helping to start the process. It seems that a lot of the work you do at the Nature Conservancy is about helping keep nature healthy so it can keep us healthy. And I wanna make sure that we talk about that today. So can you tell us a little bit more about the journey that water takes from the Potomo to the city of Bogota? That's totally right, Tyler. Um, at the Nature Conservancy, we do focus on protecting ecosystems to keep them healthy. Um, so let's explore a little bit better this water's journey from the source, water in Chingasa, and talk about what it encounters along the way, which is a lot. So everything starts in the park where plants capture the rain and the mist. The water is released slowly and eventually ends up in the lakes and rivers in and around the park. There are all kinds of activities happening outside the park. You know, when water quality can be impacted before water leaves the rivers and lakes in Chingasa and makes the way to the city. During the journey, Water travels through farming, ranching areas where it can be exposed to lots of soil, fertilizers, manure, um, it, which actually can lower the quality of the water. Once the water reaches the city of Bogota, of course, it is filtered and cleaned at a, a water filtration plant so that people like you and me can safely drink it. Our goal at TNC is to try to minimize the impact of the activities that is hurt the quality of water that we all depend on. It's amazing that water takes such a long journey uh, to get to people's kitchen sinks in Bogota from the natural environment in Chingasa. And you know, it's really easy, I think, to take for granted where our water comes from because you can just turn on the faucet and, and you know, there it is. Absolutely. It's, it's just fantastic. Uh, but you need to make sure to understand what is the process behind because it's very important and nature plays a key role over there. Yeah. You know, I'd like uh, our audience to get involved and share some of the ways that, that we use water. You can use a chat box uh, to share your answers and we'll read some of them in just a few minutes. But I'll start with my own experience. Uh, just, just the other day, I was eating a cheeseburger, 
And someone mentioned to me that it, it takes a lot of water to make the burger. Uh, that's true, even though it might not sound like it at first. We call the amount of water used to make something its water footprint. So it takes over 600 gallons of water to produce the hamburger patty and a cheeseburger. It takes a lot of water to grow the grass that feeds the cattle, right? Another 13 gallons or more are used to make the cheese slice and 13 or more additional gallons are used to produce the bun. If you add tomatoes and lettuce, that's gonna use even more water. Soda is also made from water. It takes 46 gallons of water to make one 17 ounce bottle of soda. I, I never realized how much hidden water there is in the things we eat and do, not to mention the clothes we wear every day that we have to wash to keep clean. All of this could be the topic of a completely different virtual field trip. But for now, let's see what some of our viewers have to say about uh, the way that they use water. So one of the, uh, one of the responses is that uh, Kim from Chicago says, uh, we drink it when we're thirsty, which absolutely we do. That's tremendously important. Another thing is, yeah, we use it to brush our teeth. Uh, Brian from Atlanta says that we use it to cook with, to wash our hands with, to wash our clothes with. Mark from Chattanooga says that we use it to care for animals, to give them stuff to drink, to bathe them, to wash them in. Absolutely, sometimes I just like to be sprayed down with some water on a hot day. Uh, and finally, uh, uh, Julie from Arizona uh, uh, says that we use it for farming. Absolutely, and that's one of the reasons why so many things that we eat have such a big water footprint behind them because we have to water the grass that cattle eat, we have to water grains that grow that we then use to make bread and so forth. So, so many of these foods we eat, even if, even if they're not liquids, contain an incredible amount of water that went into making them. So thanks everyone for sharing your thoughts with us. It's really easy to forget just how many things in our everyday life require water. Now, I'd like to go back to our students at White Oak Middle School. I'd love to hear from some of our sixth graders why they think water is important in their city. Okay. Yes, so first of all, Chloe, how's it going? Good. Good, so why is water important for you? It is important to stay, it is important to stay hydrated and we need clean drinking water every day. Absolutely, an incredibly important use for water. All right. I'd like to introduce Kamsi. How's it going? It's all good. Good. Good to see you. Tell us about water. Okay. All of our parks have water, fount <laughs> water fountains. It's important for people who are hiking and biking in the hot summer months. Absolutely. Hot summer months. People who are hiking and biking are definitely going to want to use that water just to, just to stay cool. And finally, Bongani, how are you doing? Me, I'm great. Tell us something that you can think of, of why water is important for you or for the people in your city. The trees and flowers in my neighborhood need water to grow. Absolutely. So those are three great additional reasons for why we need water, why it's important to us, why it's important to our city. So this is great information, and thank you so much for sharing it with us. As you can tell, water is, uh, is really important. And as uh, 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 Bongani said at the end, it's important that we, we water the trees, the flowers, the plants. Uh, and going back to Chingasa, uh, Alejandra, you mentioned that moss is a plant that's found in Chingasa. Can, can you tell us a little bit more about the plants that live there? Yes, Tyler, you are talking about flora. Um, the word flora means the plants of a particular place. It is estimated that Chingasa National Park has more than 2,000 species of plants. Um, 
And there are eight different species of sphagnum or peat moss, which actually is pretty impressive. It can absorb up to 40 times its weight in water. Think of it as a huge sponge. Um, the moss absorbs the water and slowly releases it into the atmosphere and so Isn't that cool? That's awesome. And I noticed that there's some, uh, some really tall, kind of furry looking plants in the Parma, which are unlike anything I've, I've ever seen before. Can you tell us more about those? Absolutely. Um, you are talking about the frailejones. The name frailejones means big monk in Spanish because when seen through the mist of the Parma, the plants look like a medieval monk, you know, with these big uh, uh, huts. Well, the scientific name for them is Espeletia. The frailejón belongs to the sunflower family, and there are more than 142 species of frailejones with um, each looking a little different, but still having a flower that resembles some flowers you might have seen in the US. Um, these plants live at high altitude in the Paramo, about 6,000 to 15,000 feet in elevation. They have thick, hairy leaves, and the thick trunk is covered in dead leaves for insulation from the cold. Which is interesting is that the hair leaves are very important because the hairs capture the mist that is in the air, even in the dry season. This water is then stored in the trunk of the plant and released slowly through roots and dissolved throughout the year. This means the water absorbed and stored by the moss and fry lejones becomes part of the water cycle and is available to the plants, wildlife, and people of the Paramo, and of the people of Bogota year-round. That's fascinating. So if I understand this correctly, these plants are able to pull water out of the air, uh, bring it down into, into, their own, uh, into their own leaves, into sort of their own bodies, into the trunk, and then that enters the water cycle and then that can then make its way down to the people of Bogota. You are absolutely right. They play a key role in the water system. So we need to work to protect them because we need them. That's amazing. And in some of the, the photos that we saw earlier, uh, the Frelejones look really tall. Um, Alejandro, do you know how tall they can get? You are right. Many of them are gigantic. No? Mm, they can grow over 30 feet tall. And think about it. Since each one of only grows less than an inch per year, it means that many of the largest frailejones in this park are more than 400 years old. That's incredible. Uh, to think, you know, one inch per year, that's really, really slow. And a lot of these are, as you mentioned, maybe even 400 years old, right? All the more reason why preserving these is so important. They grow so slowly. They have to be tall to pull in that moisture from the air, but they play such a critical role for the environment. So conservation of plants like this, so incredibly important. And they also look like some of the furriest plants I've ever seen. They look sort of like, you know, furry furry sunflowers. And, and it's amazing how that hair, as you mentioned, is, is important to the plant, not just for decoration, but because it plays this really important role in helping the plants pull the moisture out of the air. Um, an incredibly exciting example of how plants are adapted to their environment. So we've talked about plants for a while, but Alejandro, can you tell us a bit about the animals that we would see in this region? Absolutely. You are talking about uh, fauna um, or the animals that we can see in the region. The spectacled bears is South America's only bear species. The footage you are seeing now shows a real video of these bears on a farm, just outside Chingasa National Park, very close. The family that lives there has been using a camera trap to learn if bears are coming back to the area. So 
a camera trap is a camera that is hidden outside and starts recording when it senses uh, uh, so any kind of movement. It's the way in what scientists can learn about animals, like the spectacle bear, that usually are difficult to observe. So the fact that a spectacle bear has been seen in this area means that the ecosystem is healthy enough to support them. That's good news for ecosystem and, of course, for the bears. So you talked about these camera traps, which kind of automatically start recording when an animal gets close. Is it difficult for humans to find spectacle bears or, or to get video of them in the wild? It is. They are not that easy to be seen. Uh, of course, they are trying to be peaceful and isolated when nobody is in contact with them. So that's why we try to explore a little bit better where are they, how do they move around the park, and that's where the camera traps get into action. Those are fantastic because no one could be around, but actually you can capture video from the, from the birds moving around. Yeah, that's really cool. And for uh, those of the viewers who came with us on the virtual field trip to China a year or two ago, you might remember that scientists there used camera traps to look at pandas in the wild. But the bears in these, in these videos look very different from bears that I've ever seen here in the US. Can you tell us a little bit more about how they got their name? Sure, Tyler. Um, the white and pale yellow marks around their face, neck and chest, are how they get their name in Spanish. They are called oso de anteojos, which is literally bear with glasses. Um, they look a little different than the black bears and grizzly bears seen in North America. They are excellent climbers and spend a lot of time up in trees. Um, even though they, these bears usually weigh over 300 pounds, they are generally shy, um, peaceful, isolated, avoiding contact with humans. That's the way they want to live. Spectacle bears usually eat fruit, uh, berries, and other plants. And uh, sometimes when fresh fruit is not available, they eat uh, like tree bark and occasionally small animals. But you said occasionally they eat small animals. I usually think of bears as, you know, eating a lot of meat. I, I don't usually think about them you know, eating a lot of fruits and, and things like that? Not in this case. They're absolutely flexible, and that means that they are ready to eat everything they find in the paramo. And you said occasionally some small animals, but that's not the main food for them. So besides the spectacle bears, what are some of the other mammals that live in the paramo? Well, th there is a lot of different mammals in the Paramo. In fact, there are 456 species of mammals in Colombia. And sadly, about 22% of them are endangered. Um, let me tell you about some of the really interesting ones. Uh, tapirs are really weird looking animals. It may surprise you, but they are excellent swimmers. Um, and divers and spend much of their time in the water. Um, the tapir uses its nose to feed on leaves, bats, and small branches. Um, there are also big cats like jaguar and puma. They are completely different in appearance and features. Pumas are large and really fast cats. You might know them as cougars or mountain lions. They are one of the most adaptable felines and are found in a variety of different habitats, including in the Western US, as well as Central and South America. And then jaguars are the largest cat species in the Americas. They look like leopards, but they are larger and have a shorter tail. And sometimes they can even be all black. Unlike many cat species, Jaguars are excellent swimmers. Yeah, I loved that clip in the previous video that showed that jaguar, you know, swimming through a river or, or swimming through a lake. 
just as you said, that's not something that you usually think about cats doing, but it looked like it was pretty happy. They are, absolutely, yeah. So we talked about some of the mammals, but I understand that Colombia also has the largest number of bird species of any country, almost 2,000 different types of birds. Can you tell us a little bit about some of the birds that we'd find in the Paramo? Absolutely. Some of the birds in the Paramo include golden eagles, Andean condors, and hummingbirds. Some of you have probably seen an eagle or a hummingbird before. So let's talk uh, a little bit more about Andean condors, which are unique uh, to South America. They're actually the largest flying bird in the world by combined weight and wingspan. How awesome! The Andean condor has a wingspan of up to almost 11 feet. Can you imagine that? That's These incredible. That's almost absolutely. two people lying down next to each other. That is incredibly long. You are right. They are huge and they're just amazing. These birds are um, scavengers and feel mostly on animals that are already dead. Um, their head and neck are featherless, but their bodies are covered by black feathers. The condor is one of my favorite birds. It's, it's just fantastic. It's huge and it's kind of our emblematic bird here in Colombia. So you said that the Andean condor is your favorite bird. What are some of your other favorite animals? You know, I also love deers. We have a lot of deers here in Chingasa National Park. They are friendly. You can uh, get approached to them very easily. You can literally almost play with them because they are so familiar with humans. I love them as well. The Paramo seems like such an amazing place with its unique flora and fauna. It's, it's a place that I would love to visit sometime in person. Um, but, but tell me, are there, are there threats to this ecosystem? Unfortunately, there are. Um, when I was young, no one lived around Chingasa National Park uh, like they do right now. As more people move to these areas, uh, well, they are becoming increasingly urbanized or more city-like. This means there is more need for water and other resources and less space for plants and, and animals. Uh, many farmers are using the land for things like growing potatoes or cattle ranching. This can cause problems for the Paramo. So here's a question for you, right? I know that you know, people need to eat and farming is necessary to, uh, to raise a lot of that food. Why is farming a problem for the Paramo? You're right. When people farm or ranch, they usually clear the land of the native trees, plants or grasses. Um, this is what we call deforestation. This may not seem like a big deal, but actually it is a big deal. When native plants are removed from an area, it affects the organism that will normally live there because their habitat is changing. The land is also threatened by mining, other developments. This is why it is increasingly important to the people in and around the Paramo, the people of Bogota and the people around the world to protect the land and the plants that provide our water resources is absolutely important. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, you know, you mentioned deforestation, and previously we talked about uh, the the giant frailejones plants uh, that are able to to pull in water and 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 contribute to the the water ecosystem around Bogota. So you can imagine that if people start cutting down those plants, those those native species that's going to have a tremendous impact, not just on the immediate area, but also all those people in Bogota who rely on a lot of the water coming from, from the national park and, and the surrounding areas. Um, Absolutely. I, I have a question for you. You know, these issues that you're describing, deforestation, um, um, mining, the threats that, that farms have on natural ecosystems, are there similar issues going on elsewhere in the world, or are these problems uh, unique to Colombia? 
I would say people around the world have similar problems, whether they face droughts or flooding or struggle to access to clean water or need to find ways to farm or ranch that keep the land and the water healthy. When it comes to water, we are all on the same boat. Um, we have only talked about deforestation, the removal of trees and plants from a specific area, but water contamination is another huge problem. If water is contaminated in an area, say from fertilizers or cattle manure that enter the waterway is no longer usable as healthy drinking water. That's a big problem. Some places have other issues like being very, very dry, making it nearly impossible for plants to grow. All these problems can be addressed. For example, people work together in the Paramo and other parts of the world to protect ecosystems and water resources. This makes it possible for places like Bogota, my city, another city, to have enough clean water. It's really inspiring to hear that we can work to find solutions to these problems. And I, I want to hear more about the ways that we can do that working together and we can protect our water resources as well as the ecosystems at home and, and around the world. But before we talk about that, I want to take a short break and answer a few of the questions that have come in from our viewers. We've had just constant comments coming in and we've got some really good ones. So I'm sorry that we're not going to have time to get to everybody's questions, but these are, uh, there, there are a few uh, that I want to try to get through so that we can, can, uh, can hear what these are. Uh, so, so Alejandro, Lila asks, what does Paramo mean? Paramo is um, um, a technical name to describe a grassland, but a grassland that is located up there in the high Andean elevation, you know, in the Andes in South America is the only place in the world in which we have Paramo. So that's a very local name, yeah. but it's a grassland basically. So it's a grassland, all right. Maria from Oklahoma wants to know, can frailejones grow in other areas? No, uh, these are endemic species and Degmi means absolutely local. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why they take so much time to grow uh, because they are completely adapted to this geography and only in this area you can see frailejones. So I've got a question from Andrea here who asks something, it's not about the ecosystems in Colombia, but she asks, what is one of your favorite Colombian foods? Wow. Thanks for that question. I love um, um, a very similar word, frijoles, which is basically beans. And we eat a lot of beans here in Colombia. Um, and there's a very famous dish in Colombia, which is uh, cazuela de frijoles, which is uh, a soup made with beans, which is absolutely fantastic. It sounds delicious. It is. M Mike, uh, Mike wants to know how long is the dry season in the Paramo? It's supposed to be uh, about cycles of six months of, of rainy season and six months of dry season. So um, it's a uh, two seasonal period in Colombia, which means a half of the year on drought, let's say less rain, and a half of the year on rainy season. All right, a question from Julie, who wants to know, does it ever snow in the mountains of Colombia? Thanks, Julie, but no, we don't have snow here in the tropical areas. However, we have some glaciers that are actually the peaks from high altitude in the Andes. But uh, no, we don't have no snow, unfortunately, because it's so cool. No snow. Emily wants to know, are spectacle bears endangered? Yes, they are. Um, we are promoting some conservation programs with landowners on this area to protect the spectacle bears, basically to not affect their um, way in way of life, you know, protect the paramo in which they are located, the food they eat. So yes, unfortunately, they are endangered, but uh, we have a lot of problems with local people living in there 
and government programs to protect the spectacle deer. We need him. All right, and we have uh, two last questions. Uh, these are both about the language in Colombia. So Michelle wants to know, what language do you speak in Colombia? Uh, and Tracy wants to know, how many different languages are spoken in Colombia? We have just one official language in Colombia, which is Spanish. We speak Spanish, so buenos dias a todos. Are there, uh, are there any other uh, uh, native languages that you know of that are spoken in, in, in Colombia? We do. We have some local indigenous languages in some areas of the country. Uh, of course, they're, they are all of them recognized, not that talk, unfortunately, uh, because our official language is Spanish. Cool. Those were great questions. Uh, and I, I really want to apologize to all those people that we didn't have time to get to. We had so many good questions and we could only pick a, a few of those. Alejandro, thanks so much for, for helping out with those answers. Absolutely, my pleasure. What a great questions we had. Yeah, those are awesome. So now Alejandro, I, I wanna get back into talking about some of the things that can be done to help protect water in the Paramo. Sure, um, one of the solutions is something called a water fund. Um, it's a really cool idea that is part of the work I do at the Nature Conservancy. In some water funds, a few companies and public agencies will come together and put some money aside um, to protect water at its source. They do this by supporting reforestation programs or tree planting activities, water protection, and other kinds of activities. Water funds actually can help farmers and ranchers, like we were talking before, to work with the land in a way that still allows them to make a living, but this is good for the ecosystem, some healthy water. In Colombia, the Nature Conservancy partners with businesses, um, other organizations and government agencies to establish water funds. Um, it is one of the ways we are able to help ensure uh, that there is a good supply of safe water for people. That sounds like such important work. And as you said earlier, we're all in the same boat when it comes to water. Uh, so I, I really like how the idea of these water funds brings all the people together who have a stake in water use, uh, and it encourages people to protect water at its source, right, and along, along its path. So here's another question for you. How can the students who are watching today help protect and save water wherever they live? Thanks, Tyler. Um, the best place to start is for you all to find out where your water comes from. Think about it for a minute. Next time you will be opening your water tap at home. And then next time you walk around the city um, um, with your parents, for example, take notice of the location of different bodies of water. These are all part of your local watershed. You can search online to find out the name of your watershed, and you can also find out if your water comes from a watershed in which you live, or maybe somewhere else. Your teacher can help you to figure this out. Oftentimes, um, there is a local program related to the protection of your city's water. Ask your parents and teachers to help find out how you can get involved. It will be very interesting. Probably the easiest way to help save water is to really think about what you are using water for and how much you need. Even though it might not seem like it, water is a limited resource. It's something you think you need to think about the next time you take a long and hot shower. Don't yeah, waste water, that's a key message. Absolutely right. Those are those are great. Those are great tips. Really important things to keep in mind. Uh, and before we go, uh, uh, here are just you know some of the some of these reminders. Right, right. That you can you can help protect water where you live uh, by trying your best not to waste it. Alejandro, as you just said, you know never litter or pollute 
and 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 make sure to spread the word about this. I'm I'm guessing that everyone learned something today about water that they didn't know before. And so we encourage you to go home and share this news with your friends and family tonight. We've learned so much and I've had a great time, but unfortunately, uh, we're almost out of time. So to our classroom in Silver Spring, Maryland, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks so much. Bye, it was great to chat with you guys. Alejandra, it was great talking to you and learning more about the Potomo and Chingasa National Park. Do you have anything you'd like to add? Sure, Tyler. Thank you so much for having me here. It was a pleasure. Um, my main message, I think, um, is already been said here is, think where your water comes from. It's absolutely important for you to get involved. Water is not for granted, so, Get involved in the process you need to get accomplished to understand where your water comes from. Thank you so much, Tyler. Oh, thank you. It was a pleasure. All right. Well, if you want to learn more about the role that nature and water plays in both Colombia and Chingasa National Park, you can find links to information, videos, and activities in the teacher's guide as well. Check it out by following the URL on your screen. And many thanks to Lowe's for providing support for today's virtual field trip. Thank you so much for joining us. And until next time, goodbye.